Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today we're going to be examining the higher level content in Topic 2.2, Energy and Biomass and Ecosystems. Let's get into it. First, we're going to explore how organisms acquire carbon compounds, which raises interesting questions about resource use in ecosystems. All living organisms can be classified as either autotrophs or heterotrophs. Autotrophs are the self-feeders. They synthesize carbon compounds from inorganic sources and other elements. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, they have to obtain their carbon compounds from other organisms. This fundamental division shapes how energy and resources flow through every ecosystem. Within the autotrophs, we have two distinct strategies. Photoautotrophs, like plants, use light as their external energy source for photosynthesis. Photo means light. But there's also a fascinating group called the chemoautotrophs, and they use exothermic inorganic chemical reactions as their energy source for chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is like photosynthesis, except it doesn't use light. It uses those exothermic inorganic chemical reactions in a similar process to produce energy-containing compounds or biomass. These chemosynthetic organisms are often found in deep-sea hydrothermal vents, and they demonstrate how life can thrive in seemingly inhospitable environments without relying on sunlight. This diversity of strategies raises important questions about how we value different types of ecosystems. Primary productivity measures the rate at which biomass is produced using external energy sources and inorganic materials. We measure productivity in units like kilos of carbon per square meter per year. Understanding primary productivity is essential for making ethical decisions about resource management. When we measure productivity in different ecosystems, we gain insight into their capacity to sustain life and support biodiversity on Earth. Secondary productivity represents the gain in biomass by consumers when they use the carbon compounds absorbed from their food, which was produced by the producers. This is more complex to measure than primary productivity because it involves tracking not just what organisms eat, but how efficiently they convert that food into new biomass. These measurements help us understand the true environmental cost of producing food at different trophic levels. Net primary productivity forms the foundation of food chains because it represents the quantity of carbon compounds sustainably available to primary consumers. This idea is really important because it helps us understand the ethical implications of food production. When we know how much energy is actually available to consumers, we can make better decisions about resource allocation and about sustainable harvesting. Maximum Sustainable Yield, or MSY, represents the highest harvest that can be taken without depleting a resource. This idea applies to both primary productivity, like forestry, as well as secondary productivity, like fisheries and aquaculture. The challenge lies in accurately determining these yields while considering the needs of both human societies and natural ecosystems. One critical ethical consideration emerges when we recognize that sustainable yields are higher for lower trophic levels. This scientific fact has profound implications for food security and environmental justice. It's generally more efficient and sustainable to consume organisms from lower trophic levels, particularly plant-based foods. This should inform some of our decisions about global food production systems. Ecological efficiency measures the percentage of energy that's transferred from one trophic level to another one. The transfer typically ranges from somewhere in the 5 to 20% range, and it varies between ecosystems and species. A lot of times you'll see this referred to as the 10% rule because it's kind of right in the middle of that range. When we understand these efficiency rates, that helps us evaluate the environmental impact of different food production methods, and it helps us make more ethical choices about resource use. Finally, the second law of thermodynamics shows us how entropy, or disorder, increases as biomass passes through ecosystems. This principle helps explain why some resource use patterns are inherently unsustainable. Living systems can maintain their organization only by increasing entropy elsewhere in the system, and that has implications for how we think about ecosystem management and resource conservation. These ideas help us understand both the scientific principles that govern the movement of energy and biomass in ecosystems, as well as the ethical considerations we have to weigh when we make decisions about how we use resources and how we produce our food. When we combine what we know about ecosystem energetics with ethical reasoning, 
we can work towards more sustainable and more equitable resource management practices, and particularly when it comes to agriculture and aquaculture. I hope you found this video helpful, and until next time, happy learning.